What's up guys? My name is Rithu Kostagi and today I'm going to be teaching you everything you need to know about AP Physics C Mechanics Unit 2. So now before I begin, please go to the description right now and get my free AP Physics C Mechanics book and that book has everything you need to know to get a 5 and an A in your class. So what are you waiting for? Get it right now. And now let's begin immediately with Unit 2. So what are contact forces? So contact forces occur when two objects are in direct contact with each other. And examples are friction force, normal force, tension force, spring force, and the applied force. And the, and the reason is that normal force is a contact force because you're in contact with like the ground. And then tension force is because there's a rope or a string or something tied to an object. Friction force, again, you're in contact with a surface. And then spring force is because you're in contact with a spring. And then the applied force is because there's something or someone applying a force on another object. So that's why they're all contact forces. Now there's also field forces, which is basically uh, among two objects that are not in contact with each other. And examples of field forces are gravitational force, electric force, and magnetic force. And basically gravitational force is caused by the gravitational field. And then electric and magnetic forces, you don't need to worry about that. That's for either AP Physics 2 students or AP Physics C electricity students. So this unit is incomplete without Newton's three laws. So basically, Newton's first law says that an object at rest remains at rest unless an external force acts on it. And then if an, ob if an object is at constant velocity, then it will continue to move at that velocity unless, again, an external force acts on it. Now, Newton's second law is what relates force and acceleration. Basically, a force on an object will lead to an acceleration, and then the net force equals to mass times acceleration. And then Newton's third law states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now this means that if you apply a force onto something, then that object will apply the force, same force back on you. Now friction. Now there's two types of friction, static and kinetic. And then static friction is the friction force on an object that does not slide relative to a surface, while kinetic friction is the friction force on an object that does slide relative to a surface. So basically there's coefficients of friction. So there's a static coefficient of friction and there's a kinetic coefficient of friction. And then in general, the static coefficient of friction will be larger than the kinetic coefficient of friction. So now let's see an example of this. So basically pretend there's an object at rest on the road. So you start to apply force on it. So you start with a force of zero, right? You slowly increase that force. It's still not moving. But then suddenly, the force that you apply will be enough. And then that block will start to move. And then that force that's necessary is the threshold of motion. And that's when the force you apply is equivalent to the static friction force. And once that happens, once that occurs, then the block will start to move, and once it starts to slide relative to the surface, that's when kinetic friction occurs. Now, free body diagrams are one of the most important things in this course. So basically, you draw a diagram, and then you label all the forces and the direction they're pointing in. So free body diagram is super important, because using that free body diagram, you're going to be making, uh, writing equations out for Newton's second law. So it's very important. Now, uniform circular motion, it happens in a circular path, and the object that undergoes uniform circular motion must do it at constant speed, and the velocity of that object is tangent to the circle that it makes. And the acceleration is known as centripetal acceleration, and it always points towards the center of the circle. And note that this acceleration does not change the speed, because the speed is constant. It only changes the direction of the object. And then the formula for centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. Now the centripetal force points towards the center. That's the force that causes centripetal motion. So basically, since we know that the acceleration is v squared over r, then the force is simply mass times acceleration, so mv squared over r, where r is the radius. Now there's one important thing that I want to tell you. The centripetal force is not a force that you will ever label on a free body diagram. The centripetal force is the formal label that we give to the net force that points towards the circle. So it's not really an actual force, it's caused by other forces. So this is very important. Never label a force as F of C or something. There is no such thing as a centripetal force on the free body diagram. It's just the net force pointing towards the center. Now, a resistive force is often velocity dependent. So in this course, you'll be dealing with F equals to negative BV squared and F equals to negative BV. And since we know that the acceleration is the net force over the mass, and if the resistive force is the only force on that object, then that means that acceleration will be something like negative BV squared over M or negative BV over M. However, this is pretty complicated, right? We're working with acceleration and then the velocity both at once, and the velocity is also changing. 
So that means acceleration is also changing. So how do we work with this? Now that's when calculus comes in. Acceleration is the same thing as dv over dt because acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So that means dv over dt equals to negative bv squared over m. And now we use separation of variables. So we bring all terms of dv and v to one side. So we get 1 over v squared dv and that equals to minus bm over t dt. And now we integrate both sides. So after we integrate both sides, we can find an expression for velocity and you'll see an example of this very soon. Now let's look at a free response question from the actual AP exam. Please pause the video and read the problem and try it on your own. So by now I hope you actually tried the problem. So now let's begin. So basically in this problem, right, there's a car that's moving. It's driven to the right and then there is a constant force on it, F of O. This is caused by the engine. And then there is a resistive force on it, minus kV. And then of course there is a normal force and then gravitational force. Now in part A, we want to draw the free body diagram. So basically in this problem, there is normal force, gravitational force, this resistive force, and the constant force, which is basically caused by the engine. So resistive force points to the left, normal force points up, gravitational force points down, and then the force caused by the engine points to the right. Now in part B, we want to write an expression for the horizontal acceleration of the car. We only consider the forces in the x direction. So F of O minus kV. That's the net force. And since we know net force equals to mass times acceleration, we can divide both sides by m to get that acceleration is F of O minus kV over m. Now in part C, we want to derive an expression for the velocity of the car as a function of time t. How would we do that? Well, we just found the acceleration in part B. And we know that the acceleration is dV over dt. So we set dv over dt to the expression we found for acceleration. And now we use separation of variables. So we bring f of o minus kv to the side with dv, and then we bring 1 over m to the side with dt, and then we integrate both sides. And then after we integrate both sides, we can get this expression that you see on the screen. Now we multiply both sides by k, and then now we have the natural log of f of o minus kv over f of o, and that equals to minus kt over m. So now we bring in E to cancel the natural log out. Now after we rearrange this, we can get this as the expression for velocity. So this problem is heavily dependent on your calculus skills. So if you weren't able to understand this problem and the math behind it, please check out my book, Unit 7 of AP Calculus BC. So I have an AP Calculus BC book. You can find it on the website. So please check, that, check it out because it's very important to be able to integrate and differentiate and all that sorts of calculus stuff in AP Physics C Mechanics. So in part D, we want to sketch the graph of the car's velocity as a function of time t. So in, in whenever we're asked to find such graphs and it just says label important values on the vertical axis, you don't really need to be very specific. What matters is you're showing the right direction and what it's heading towards. So in this problem, whenever we have a resistive force, there will be a time the velo when the velocity becomes basically constant and the reason is that the net force is zero so that means the velocity will be increasing rapidly initially right but then later it will curve out when it reaches the maximum possible value for velocity now for part e we want to sketch the do the same thing we just did but we want to do it for acceleration so initially there will be more acceler acceleration so you'll be starting at the top right but then as your velocity increases your net force decreases because the force by the engine is constant. So the net force is going to be decreasing as velocity goes up and that means acceleration will be heading downwards towards zero. So that means the graph will be shaped like this. Now let's look at another free response question from an actual AP exam. So basically please pause the video again and try the problem on your own. So by now I hope you actually tried the problem. So let's go over the solution. So basically in this problem, right, we're given that the maximum mass that can be hung vertically from a string without breaking that string is 10 kilograms. So that basically means that the tension force, right, it can only handle the weight of this mass. That's the maximum weight it can handle. And then a length of this string that is two meters long is used to rotate a 0.5 kilogram object in a circle on a frictionless table with the string horizontal. And then the maximum speed that the mass can attain under those conditions without the string breaking is most nearly, and that's what we want to find. We want to find the maximum speed of this mass. So we know that the tension can only handle a weight of 10 kilograms when the block is hung vertically. So that means the tension force equals to mg, which equals to around 100 newtons because the mass is 10 and then the gravitational field is around 10. 
So we get 100 newtons. And then we also know that when we are spinning this uh, ball, right, in a circle, then the tension force is what's causing the centripetal motion. And that means tension force equals to mv squared over r, because tension is the only force pointing towards the center of the circle when it's moving horizontally. So that means tension equals to mv squared over r. And we already found tension. And we know mass is 0.5. And we know that the radius is 2. So now we get this expression you see on the screen. And then we can isolate for v squared to find that the v squared is 400, which means v is 20 meters per second. Now, thank you so much for watching this video. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, since that's going to tell me that you guys are truly enjoying and learning from the books and the videos that I've been making for you guys. And don't forget to join the Discord server to meet other hardworking students that are preparing for various competitions and exams, such as the AP exams. And also, don't forget to follow the Instagram, if you have Instagram, to uh, view educational reels and cool animations. And again, thank you so much for watching this video, and I really hope to see you soon back again on this channel.